thinking recently about relationships. I've been doing a lot of thinking about relationships as I've said goodbye to some old friends, said goodbye to a congregation. Uh, thinking a lot about relationships as I'm starting to form new relationships and say hello to a new congregation. And some of you are probably kind of in the same boat. You're sitting back there, you're wondering, all right, is this a 45-minute sermon or a 15-minute <laughs> sermon? You guys are trying to figure me out. That's what happens in relationships. You try and figure each other out. You wonder how it's going to go. And, you know, relationships are kind of hard. And sometimes, especially early on in relationships, you're tempted to do that overanalyzing thing where you start to wonder about every interaction. You start to, to worry, well, did I say that wrong? Or what did they mean when they said that? And, and I found a lot of comfort in this image that I found. And I've come to think about it uh, in terms of how you find, feel out and figure out relationships. You see, I've come to understand that relationships are woven together over time. Kind of like uh, this rope is woven together over time. Um, yeah, there we go. Slowly, bit by bit, interaction by interaction, a, a rope is formed, a connection is formed, a relationship is formed. And so it's not about the single interaction, but interactions over time. Interactions over time in which God weaves us together as his family, uh, through which he binds us together, how he connects us. And as, you know, life goes, sometimes those weaves, they end up a little bit wrong. They don't end up going quite right. And so that's what I want to talk about today. Because I believe that it's in relationship that God does his best work on us. God does his most significant work in relationships. I don't know, most of you are all young and dumb like I was at one time. Some a little further back than others. But at one point in time, I don't know about you, but I thought I was pretty good. I was kind of great. I thought anybody would be lucky to have me in my life. <laughs> and then I got married. <laughs> and then I had the sudden thought, I still remember it, man, am I lucky that she loves me. <laughs> because when we get in relationships, especially marriage, all of our flaws, all of our sharp edges kind of come out. We get seen for who we really are. We can't hide ourselves anymore. All of the real of us comes out. And sometimes it's a little ugly. And well, that's what God wants to work on in us. Through relationships, God wants to transform us, wants to make us into a little bit of more of who he designed us to be. You see, in relationships, uh, Jesus talks about this in Matthew chapter 18. Jesus talks about the hard stuff. And it's not necessarily what he says about relationships, but the reality of it. The reality that sometimes those who we care about most are the ones who harm us or injured. It's really hard when those people that we love and we care about feel harmed or injured by us or when we are harm or inj harmed or injured by them. See, for us as people, it's easy for us to get divided. It happens at work. It happens at school. It happens at home. It happens at churches. It happens over decisions about a building. It happens about decisions over theology. It happens about all sorts of things. Sometimes we, even in the church, forget that we, no matter whether we're Lutheran, Baptist, Catholic, or whatever, that we're actually on the same team, all have the same boss. And we fight against each other, and to me, it just seems silly. We're on the same team. Jesus Christ is trying to bring his kingdom into this world through all of us. And in the midst of these difficult things and relationships, Jesus provides us a way. And I think that it is a way, and it's best classified as a way. Because sometimes I think we look at these words that Matthew gives us in his gospel and we say, it's a recipe, it's a formula. If you do these steps, then you get to the end and you can kick them out. But I don't think that's what Jesus is saying, especially not in the gospel of Matthew. But before we get there, we need to go to this verse. Uh, we're going to do all the scripture lessons today as part of the sermon. I know that might be a little bit different. But uh, so stay on your toes. I'm just trying to keep you awake, actually. 
Um, so we're going to read some stuff together as part of the sermon. And um, this verse I'm sure you're all familiar with. Let's all read this together. For where two or three gather in my name, there am I with them. Sometimes I think we think of this as the magic Jesus verse. This idea that, okay, I'm glad you showed up because Jesus is here now. <laughs> but I don't think that that's the way that it works. Because, and that's not to say that Jesus doesn't come to be with us in a special way when we gather together as a church. It's not to say that we don't get more of Jesus when we sit down with other Christians around his word or just over dinner. I think we do get more of Jesus in those situations, but I think when we think about that like that, the magic Jesus, like, okay, we got together now, Jesus is really here. We forget about the promise that Jesus gave to all of us in Matthew chapter 28. He said in Matthew chapter 28, and lo, I am with you always, even to the very end of the age. There are no conditions put on that. He didn't say, as long as there's two of you, I'm with you. He said, I'm with you. Wherever you go, whatever you do, I'm with you. And I think particularly as we engage relationships and the difficult things of relationships, that's an important thing for us to remember. As a way of example, maybe say a prayer here as an example of maybe something you can remember we are engaging those difficult things because sometimes as followers of Jesus, we forget that we're following him and that he's leading and he's with us even in the midst of difficult stuff. Please join me in a word of prayer. Lord, relationships are difficult. As I walk into this difficult relationship and this difficult interaction, help me to remember that you're with me. Help me to remember the way that you see me. Help me to remember, though, the way that you see them. And, Lord, I just ask that in this situation, your grace would flow through me, that you would repair and restore what's broken. In Jesus' name, amen. Just an example as we get started here. But, but diving in, when it comes to relationships that have been ruptured or broken, uh, when there's hurt feelings, when someone feels injured, Jesus gives us some pretty specific instructions for how we're supposed to deal with it. Matthew chapter 18, verse 15, Jesus says this, if your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. Jesus is very clear here. Go and talk to them. Don't send them an email. Don't shoot them a text. <laughs> you can even call if you have to, but more preferably, go sit down with them. Go sit down with them and interact with them face to face. But that's hard, isn't it? Anybody else find that hard? I find that hard. It's one of the things that I think we're sometimes concerned about. We're challenge with confronting someone is sometimes we're afraid, okay, they're going to think I'm weak. Or this could cause a, a difficult situation in the relationship. This could drive us apart. If I confront them, if I deal with them, maybe things won't go well and it'll push us further apart. And so we're afraid to stand up. I think one of the prophets, um, actually most of the prophets had this problem. So Ezekiel chapter 33, here's Ezekiel who was given some hard things to say to the people of Israel. And here God is telling him again, what I tell you to say, you need to say. So let's read this together from Ezekiel chapter 33. Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the people of Israel. So hear the word I speak and give them warning from me. When I say to the wicked, you wicked person, you will surely die, and you do not dissuade, to dissuade them from their ways. They, for a good person, will die for the sin, and I will hold you accountable for their blood. But if you do warn the wicked person to turn from their ways, and they do not do so, they will die for their sin, though you yourself will be sin. So this is kind of like the minimal threshold for telling someone. 
Like, you've got to say what I'm going to say or I'm going to hold you accountable. This is the Jonah message. 40 days and the city will be overthrown. What do you mean, Jonah? He gives them the basic bare minimum. Like, you've got to say that. But I guess the way I start to think of this, I start to think about being a parent and being a watchman for my child. Needing to remind them to be kind rather than rude. Sometimes it's just because I don't want them to interrupt me. But if they go that way through life, it's not going to turn out good for them though, right? Uh, We want our kids to be givers rather than takers. And so we try and work with them on sharing and things like that. And so we watch out for them. And the way that this plays out in the long run, uh, recently at St. John's, I did six funerals. And those funerals were one of two funerals. One funeral, there was a handful of people there. The other funeral, the place was packed, regardless of age. And as I heard the stories from the family about the people, of course, they disguised it. There was one group of people that were difficult people. And the family showed up and a couple of friends, but that was about it. But they'd severed relationships with people people after people because they'd gone through life and they hadn't let anybody help them wear off those jagged edges in their lives. And so they hurt and they harmed and they injured people and nobody ever stood up and said, hey, you can't do this. Otherwise, you're going to end up pushing people away from you. This other group of people on the other side, the ones where the, the, the church was packed, These people had people in their lives that had come alongside them and said, hey, when you do that, it doesn't work. Hey, when you're you're acting like this and when you say that, you hurt people. And they came alongside these people. And as a result, they turned into kind and generous and loving and caring people. And because of that, they were connected to people all over the place. And as they connected to other people, these people cared about them and had the grace and the love of Jesus impressed on their lives. And so Jesus tells us, when you got a problem with somebody, you got to go talk to them. Not just because it's about you being hurt, but because it's also about them. If they go through life doing this to everybody they come across, they're going to drive everyone away. And that's not how God designed it to be. We're meant to be in relationship with other people. We're made for relationship. Made for relationship with God. Made for relationship with one another, especially in the body of Christ. And so Jesus encourages us, reminds us, you got to actually be in relationship with people. Which means saying, hey, when you said this, when you did that, you hurt me. And having that conversation and being real with other people. Jesus continues in um, verse 16. This is one that I'm going to have us all read together as we kind of take the next step and what Jesus says to do if it doesn't work when you go talk to the person. Continuing on at verse 16, all of us together. But if you will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. Notice the thing that Jesus doesn't say here. He doesn't say, if you have a problem with someone, go tell someone else. That is not this verse. He says, if you have a problem with someone, grab someone else and go talk to the person. That person is always involved because... I've seen it happen all over the place where one person has a problem with someone and they go tell someone else and then they go tell someone else and all of a sudden everybody has a problem with this person and this person is entirely clueless and it makes a giant mess. The other thing I've noticed is that has anyone else experienced the miracle of taking someone else into a difficult meeting? Holy cow. It is amazing. There's something about having someone sitting beside you that drains the animosity, drains the anger, that kind of flips a switch, that that helps you not to react and rather to respond. Something about having someone else there, I cannot tell you how many times that has saved me. 
And so that's what Jesus tells us to do. Take a good Christian friend along. If you've got a difficult thing, pull in someone, not someone to take your side, but someone to be there with you, to be there with you both, and to make sure that you both remember what's important, the relationship. You know, there was something really amazing at one of the churches that I served, and if you went to one of the pastors and said, you know, I heard something about this guy, da, da, you wouldn't get any further than that, and they'd say, you know, that sounds like something you should go and talk with Pastor Scott or Pastor Aaron about. There was no daylight, no daylight. I fell into the mistake. I was vickering there, and somebody came and started talking to me about somebody else, and I listened because I didn't know any better. And emboldened by talking to me, they went and talked to the other person about someone else again, and the second that they started saying someone else's name, that, that was Pastor Aaron. He said, that sounds like something you need to go talk to Pastor Scott about. Has, have you talked to him yet? That was one of the most healthy communities that I've ever been a part of. You have no idea how many problems that solves just instantly. Just go talk to the person. So, what Jesus is ultimately trying to avoid for us here is the rope becoming frayed. If anybody knows a little bit about climbing, the, the sheath around the outside is just to protect what's in the middle. What's in the middle, the core, is what holds all the weight. And so if there's a couple frays, a couple of nicks here and there in the rope, it's not a big deal. And so before a, a climber will go on a big climb, one that's dangerous, they'll inspect the rope. They'll feel the rope. And what they're feeling for is any soft spots in the core. The frays don't concern them. But what's dangerous in our lives is that if the sheath, the outside covering gets frayed, if our relationships become frayed by all sorts of different little things, it exposes the core. Exposes the core that keeps us connected together. A couple of landmines that I've kind of discovered in relationships um, that can come some, sometimes trip us up as people. One is uh, offended offending someone and uh, taking offense. Sometimes when we say something stupid and we know it, has anybody ever done that? <laughs> and we know we need to go apologize. That's on us, right? When we do something and we know it, we need to go and make it right. There's other times when someone takes offense. When someone takes offense or something we did or something we said, and we have no idea, no clue. And this happens a lot when, when no offense is intended. It just, just said something and it just was interpreted. That's on the other person. If you're taking offense to something that someone said in their lives and there's a good chance that they have no idea they offended you, you need to go and say something. Because otherwise, they're not going to know. That kind of fits with another corollary that's kind of a, a big problem for me. And that's the it's not a big deal thing. And, and what happens is little things happen. Because I've learned, I've gotten wiser as I've been married a little bit longer. Now I don't have as many years as some of you. But early on, I learned that it's not good to die on every hill. <laughs> it's good not to pick every fight. And so you say, it's not a big deal, it's not a big deal, it's not a big deal. And then all of a sudden, there's no forks, and you lose it. And your spouse is looking at you like, a fork? You're a, this upset about a fork? You've got to be kidding me. No, that didn't happen in my house, just an example. <laughs> Some of you are wondering now. And see, over time, those things can build up, and they become a fray. And they can lead to an explosion. And so that's one of the things we also got to watch out for is just kind of continually kicking it down the road and letting things build up. Um, kind of an example, actually we'll do this, this one first. The other one is ascribing a, a intent or telling a story. Sometimes in life we just do stuff. We don't mean anything by it. And the people around us get offended. Sometimes in our own heads... We see what was done, we hear what was said, and we say, they did that because they're mad at me. They did that because they don't like me. They did that because, and on and on the list goes, well, here's the truth. 
You don't know. You have no idea what they were thinking when they did that, when they said that. We cannot ascribe it to that. We cannot tell a story because we don't know. In other words, see Jesus, point number one. Go talk to them. And this kind of collects some of the, all of the things that I've talked about just a little bit. A little example. The other day, uh, Matt went to the Mac store. And he sent me a text from the Mac store saying, hey, Nate, I'm in the Mac store. Do you need anything to get your computer set up? And I texted him back. and said, no, I'm good, man. Thank you. And that was a good example of how he showed that he cared. It made me feel really welcome and really loved here on staff. It was awesome. But had I found out on the other side, like, oh, he went to the Mac store and I needed something, I could have been angry at him. I could have chosen to see that as a problem, to take a personal offense, or to let those things pile up under the category of it's no big deal until all of a sudden I blew up and said, why don't you care about me? See, this sort of stuff happens in our relationship subconsciously without us thinking about it, sometimes entirely by accident. But Jesus continues as he talks about the fray in our relationships and our lives getting worse. Uh, Matthew chapter 18, beginning at uh, the second half of verse 17. If they've refused to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. I think we forget at this point in time that this is still all about healing ruptured relationships. It's not about gaining power. It's not about settling scores. It's not about getting even. It's not about, okay, I've done the prescribed process. Now I can expel you. Now I can shun you. Now I can ignore you. It's still all about healing and restoration. And I think here's the point at which we forget that this is Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew was a tax collector. The very person that's named here. And I don't know how you do this, but this is the way I do this in my head, is pagans are bad, but they don't know any better. Matthew's a tax collector. He's helping the pagans. He's worse. And who is Jesus continually after? Pagans and tax collectors. In fact, those are the ones that sometimes responded the most enthusiastically to Jesus. It's sometimes those very ones that Jesus personally reaches out to and says, hey, climb down from that tree. Hey, leave your booth and come follow me. Jesus personally goes out after those ones. And Jesus binds himself to those type of people. Jesus binds himself to us in spite of our flaws, in spite of our mistakes, in spite of our sharp edges. He binds himself to us in his coming to earth, in his living among us, in his baptism, in his death, in his resurrection. Jesus binds himself to us. Here at this table, Jesus binds himself to us in his body and his blood and says, I am holding on to you in my grace. He gives us that core. He gives us that foundation of forgiveness and grace. He wraps us up in it, holds us tight. In Jesus, that process of avenging, of settling scores, of gaining power, of retaliation is stopped by God. And in Jesus Christ, the kingdom of God, the way of God's dealing with the world has broken in. And he invites us to be part of that work of extending his kingdom, of extending his grace, of letting his grace and his love, his way of dealing with us extend to other people. The master has forgiven our debts, wiped them away, forgotten them. He invites us to do the same in our relationships with one another. Just because others in our lives have severed the relationship with us does not mean that we have to sever our relationship with them. We can continue to hold on to them in grace. We can continue to love them and little aside here. If someone's in an abusive situation, you can love them 
but you need to do it in a safe way and from a distance. And so if you're in one of those situations or know someone who is, please hear that this is not saying stay there and be hurt. In fact, come and talk to somebody on staff that you feel close to. Come and talk to one of our elders. If you need help with a really difficult situation. But we can continue to love people that are hurt and broken because after all, we're hurt and broken people. We can continue to care for those people in grace and in prayer. As a way of encouragement, I'd like to share these incredible words from St. Paul. Uh, St. Paul, writing to Christians in Corinth, talked about how this love, this grace, this core should shape our lives as followers of Jesus. I'll start us off here in 2 Corinthians, and then um, we'll all read together. For Christ's love compels us, because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died, and he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. We once regarded Christ in this way. We do so no longer. For if anyone is in Christ, new has come, the old has gone, the new is here. All this is from Christ, who has defiled the will of himself, Christ, and gave him the tradition of reconciliation, the God in reconciling the world to himself, Christ, had an only demon and sins against them, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as through God we're making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin, sin for us, so that we might become the righteousness of God. At the root of that word, righteousness is right. Right relationship with God, right relationship with one another because of God's grace at work in our lives. Sometimes we still face that temptation to not be real with one another, not stand up, not say, hey, this is a problem. But there's a real promise in being real with one another. Uh, We experience it in our marriages, and we can experience it in our relationships among Christians as well. I'll share you this quote from uh, Tim Keller, one of my favorite authors. Uh, He writes in his book, um, The Meaning of Marriage, To be loved but not known is comforting but superficial. To be known and not loved is our greatest fear. But to be fully known and truly loved is, well, a lot like being loved by God. It is what we need more than anything. It liberates us from pretense, humbles us out of our self-righteousness, and fortifies us for any difficulty that life can throw at us. Real relationship with our spouse, with the people that God has placed in our lives, in really being loved. People really seeing all of us is real power, real encouragement. And all of that is built on the core, on the core of God's grace. You know, when it comes back to those verses from the end of that section of Matthew chapter 18... I think I read those differently now, beginning at verse 19. Again, truly I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three gather in my name, there am I with them. We don't bring Jesus. He brings us. It's Jesus that gathers us together. It's Jesus that allows us to overcome differences and difficulties. It's Jesus that smooths out our rough edges. It's Jesus. Jesus is the reason. Amen. We continue by making confession of our faith in Nicene Creed. Nicene.